Uh, my, it's my pleasure now to in introduce the last speaker of the day, uh, which is uh, Henry Lee. And Henry is, um, it's a delight to introduce Henry because uh, I've known him for a long time and we work together in, in a variety of uh, settings. He's a professor at uh, the university, at Stanford University. And uh, although he started out in Illinois, uh, he really has spent most of his career in California. Uh, he's been very involved with uh, quality improvement with the California Perinatal Quality Collaborative, CPQCC, I don't, I don't remember what the last C is for. It. But anyway, he's done a lot of that and uh, he's really an expert at mining databases to find that nugget of knowledge that will enhance what we uh, know about various uh, of, uh, various uh, parts of the population and various practices. He's an expert at quality improvement, and um, he is an associate editor for Neo Reviews. Uh, he's been in ILCOR. He's been the uh, he is a, a current coach, no, just past co-chair of the NRP Steering Committee, and uh, he is on the American Heart Association and AP. A writing committee. So uh, Henry's contributed a whole lot to resuscitation, and he's a great mentor and a wonderful leader. And I, I introduced him for uh, really telling us what's up with NRP since he just finished his four years of, uh, of leading the group. And uh, so, Henry, let's uh, have you at the podium. Carolyn, uh, and I, you know, I appreciate this um, honor of uh, being able to participate in this uh, symposium. <laughs> Excuse me. And yeah, I, my title is What's Up with NRP in 2021? And um, I'm not going to talk so much about like an update of NRP per se. Um, but really, I'm, I'm asking the question to myself and to you, what, what's up with an RP in 2021? <laughs> Maybe that will become clearer as I say. Um, you'll also have to pardon me because, because I'm at the end of the day and it's sort of a general talk that pretty much everything I'm going to say has been also stated previously <laughs> by the wonderful speakers earlier in a much more insightful way, but I'll try to inject uh, Hopefully, at least one or two new things. So, as we look to the future, I think it is um, also good to review the past. But, but really, like, what what is the future? But we think about um, before NRP, and uh, Dr. Raj talked a little bit about perhaps around the time when pediatricians started to become more involved in board grooming. I think perhaps Dr. You can contribute. Dr. Alpar for being a big part of that. And you can see here, I, I don't know that this intervention has been actually tested rigorously, <laughs> but it, it may actually be potentially effective. It looks like the baby is a vigorous in crime in that instance. But we can really say that we have progressed a lot in, in our neonatal resuscitation. Um, not only is there a, a person that's at every delivery that's uh, training in our peak, uh, but now we have skilled teams that are working together. And so in many ways, I feel like we've already sort of gotten there, maybe, you know, even as we're still trying to evolve and learn and get better, um, there's been a lot of progress. So what, what will be the next sort of perhaps, you know, incremental steps that will allow us to get even better in terms of our um, practice and outcomes? I will go over this too much because it's been stated that we um, have been uh, learning NRP since 1987 and the AHA and LCOR have been uh, close partners to, to accumulate evidence and uh, form guidelines and create education programs. It was hard for me to find anything before the fourth edition actually on the internet, <laughs> but, but this is good history because it's about, I started uh, my residency just before the fourth edition and so I can reflect back. Uh, prior to, you know, when, when I started training, we were doing things somewhat differently. We were 100% oxygen was uh, was the only thing available actually in the delivery room. We were intubating every single baby that had a new stain and had a fluid, including the vigorous uh, crying, 
you know, very active babies, and we got good at intubation because of that. And, and of course, we were um, practicing immediate for clamping. Now, as things have evolved and as things have changed, I will I will still note that I think that it's also stayed pretty similar. There has always been an emphasis on PPD and the steps that we progress through, even though the timing is maybe slightly changed, has been pretty consistent. We progress through PPD to an advanced airway compressions and then that um, So the algorithm, even though the colors have changed and the arrows are a little different, it's, it's I think it's largely stayed the same. In terms of our education materials, which, uh, which Gary has uh, uh, talked about very, very well, you know, it's the models on the cover have gotten better and better looking over time. <laughs> um, and who would have imagined, like, who would have thought that the textbook would continue to be remaining? I remember when I started with the NRD committee, we said, okay, the textbook, we're probably not going to use the textbook anymore. We got this DVD, and, and now who uses DVDs? I, I actually um, talk, I texted my uh, daughter earlier today. Uh, she just finished college. And I remember, I, I recall like, asking her, hey, do you need any money for textbooks? And so can you guess how many textbooks she bought during her four years of college? Zero is a, is a very good guess, but she bought one textbook during <laughs> four years of college. Will we continue to use textbooks? And I, I like textbooks, but I think the younger generation that's not really their main way to learn. So as we think about the old ways and as we look toward the new ways, I think uh, it's, it's I think it's good for me to, to remind myself, what's our ultimate goal? Yes, it is to become better at neonatal resuscitation as individuals and as teams, but really our ultimate goal is to improve neonatal outcomes, you know, you know locally and globally. And so we're, we can improve our teaching, but perhaps we can continue to think about how can we increase the, the scope of what we do so that the, the way we implement education and um, quality improvement can ultimately lead to uh, better outcomes for babies. And part of this will be uh, um, improving our individual practice, but I, I think uh, a big part of quality improvement is improving the systems of practice that we're in. And, and then I'll also talk a little bit about the equipment because the, the equipment has changed over the years, but it's also remained in largely the same as well. And, and what can we look toward uh, in the future for that to progress in our practice? Part of why I didn't necessarily go over like every single you know, guideline of the uh, 2021 uh, AG and NRP guidelines is that a lot of it, I think, are reinforcement previous recommendations. The science has not progressed, you know, to a, a large degree to a point where it, since the science has progressed and then it reinforces some of the things that we do. But as has been noted earlier, there remain gaps so that we weren't able to necessarily say we should change our practice to, to something else. Um, and so I'll talk a little bit about those gaps as well. But if you are looking for that sort of update, I think, uh, you know, Dr. Aziz has done a tremendous job of leading us to come up with these um, uh, guidelines. And there's this the top 10 take home messages, which are right at the beginning of this document, I think are, are very helpful. So I'll go over a couple of those in the context of what I'll be talking about as well. So the first top 10 point is newborn resuscitation requires anticipation and preparation by providers who train individually in this team. And that's, that's been sort of the NRP mantra for, for a while. So we know that there should be one person at every delivery who's responsible and trained. And then for a risk factor assessment, a higher uh, risk delivery requires a, a team that's qualified. Um, and I'm going to not talk about this too much because Gary covered it quite well, that we, we know that there are, are gaps in terms of probably in how we train, but in terms of the knowledge of what works best. Sorry. All right, so we, we know that um, probably we need some sort of booster training and every two year training is not going to be sufficient for us to, to learn or maintain our skills. And then you know, there's one study on residents 
um, showed that there were, were improved procedural skills and teamwork behaviors. Um, and then something JD's breed study, which uh, was mentioned earlier, um, that one month interval testing was able to uh, allow this um, you know, that cohort to have a better uh, learning and maintenance of knowledge. And then the RPY partners is one example of a way that booster training can be uh, implemented. And it, you know, this covers the essentials. So uh, the MRSOP part of Mr. Sopa, and I'll include like half of the A with the uh, virtual mask, but not intubation. And um, sorry, we, we can also imagine though that there's other ways that we can implement booster training, even if you don't have that sort of technology um, in our practice. And, you know, I think uh, as mentioned, um, just in time, simulation in order to practice for uh, a complicated delivery or on an every uh, couple of week basis. Uh, if you haven't been in the delivery room recently, I think there are, are ways to strategize and implement those uh, maintenance of skills. And in terms of simulation-based team training, I think we've all come to, a, to adopt simulation-based team training and really value it and, and feel like it is a uh, something that's valuable for us to, to gain skills, but the evidence for that is is still somewhat um, lacking in terms of does it actually improve patient outcomes. So in that context, we've been interested in our California network, the CPQCC, to try to do uh, try to see what we can do with quality improvement in order to um, sort of complement NRP and uh, improve patient outcomes. So just a, a little background on CPPCC, it's 140 NICUs in California, and we, we facilitate quality improvement. And in 2010, 2011, we planned a, a QI project just after the fourth edition, I think that came out, to help units to get better at, at doing NRP. So that, that project involved 20 NICUs who, who signed up for a year, and we said, let's work together to implement MRP and learn together. And you know, it was, it was a general goal to implement MRP and get better at the order of management, but there were three sort of main goals. Prevent hypothermia in preterm infants, because the, looking at the data, we saw that there was a, a very large gap in practice in that thing. And then also to reduce um, intubation, or basically implement non-invasive ventilation when needed, at delivery in order to try to um, hopefully prevent EPD. And then there was also this notion of let's try to learn how to be better at briefing and debriefing, both in training as well as in, in real life resuscitations. So this collaborative quality improvement is something that we've been doing um, over the years in a variety of clinical topics. But uh, we, as we learned how to do NRP together, we also asked our collaborative members who are participating you know, what aspects of this collaborative quality improvement are helping you to get better? And this, this was all data study, so we, we sort of did focus groups and interviews. And if some of the lessons learned were that they really appreciated that the visual cues for education and practice and, and outcomes. So what that means is both in terms of uh, helping them to learn, but also visual um, diagrams of data that could show how they were doing over time and also compared to other centers who work with this region. So this is the result of our collaborative, and I've sort of, I have to admit, I cherry picked some of the, the better results, I guess, of the collaborative quality improvement, but we were able to show that there was a reduction, a pretty significant reduction in hypothermia for people. And the, the other lines there um, in those figures are that, um, are there, are another group of NICUs who actually, so we had these 20 NICUs who are doing quality improvement and working together. We met every month, we met in person every three months and sort of talked about how, how we were doing and shared like barriers uh, to what, what the work was as well as successes and shared data. There were another uh, group of NICUs that embarked on this QI project alone, so to speak. We gave them the resources, the materials to do quality improvement and um, you know, gave them the data forms that fell out so they could track how they were doing. 
Uh, so that's what that we call a NICU QI, individual NICU QI. And then there were a group of NICUs you know, for the rest of the NICUs in California that were collecting data, but were not doing QI in immune resuscitation. And what we saw was that over that year, year and a half period, was that everybody improved somewhat. You know, the NRP had just come out before implementing it. But we found that the collaborative group, the ones who were meeting together every month, uh, did significantly better, both in terms of preventing hypothermia, preventing into, like reducing the number of babies they intubated, as well as ultimately uh, reducing the rate of BPD compared to the other NICUs. Now, you know, what, what we actually did this, this NICU QI, the individual level quality improvement, not to prove that it wasn't better, but we actually did it to try to show that it would be just as good as collaborative quality improvement because collaborative quality improvement takes uh, money in, to organize people to meet every month. Um, you know, it takes a little bit more effort. And uh, so we wanted to try to see like, hey, can we do like a scaled down effort to, I mean, will it be just as good? And we're still evolving and trying to, to figure out what aspect of collaborative QI sort of leads to this sort of result. Um, because we realize that it's not possible for everybody to, to, to do something like that. And so we have continued our QI efforts in mineral station uh, over the past few years, and we call this project simulating success. <laughs> and we have 15 issues. Um, 15 NICUs participate in this. Um, this the tail end was a little bit uh, curtailed by COVID. Uh, but but we really learned a lot uh, through this project. And basically what we did here was we said, let's really focus on simulation and debriefing as a strategy for getting better together. And so every three, uh, every three months, uh, a cluster of three to five hospitals initially came to Cape, where uh, so Nicole and um, Lou, who leads that center, um, sort of trained a couple of uh, leaders of each of these hospitals to learn how to do simulation and debriefing better so that they could then train some of their colleagues and then uh, implement this across their um, NICU. And, and we really um, tried to learn how to do inside to simulation better. So this is a, this, you see this picture here, I'm not sure if you can see well, but it's, it's a, a delivery room uh, resuscitation bed, a radiant warmer, the drawer. And, I have definitely seen drawers that look like this. And I'm not sure if this one was sort of, you know, purposefully made to look like this, but it's not, you know, it's not uncommon that I might see something like this at various hospitals that are practice. And so it, doing this scenario, you could, you could have a learning objective. Okay, let's put um, a scenario where you need to find a meconium aspirator and let's put it at the bottom of this drawer. And that, that'll be the challenge. And, and so, you know, in the debriefing, you know, you could part of it might be, hey, like, what, you know, what prevented you from doing well in this scenario? So you couldn't find the voting respirator. And the learning point might be, okay, you need to be prepared and try to look for it before you need it, right? Or you could say, oh, the team needs to be better to be like thinking about this before you did initially. But really, if, if they're making this sort of mistake, and another team makes the same mistake in another, some of, some of us might think, oh, it's a good scenario. It's a good debriefing and like there's a good learning point. But maybe the problem isn't with the learners, it's the problem with the system. And so uh, many of our NICUs focused on what we call uh, late and safety threats or systems errors. Uh, so yes, yeah, simulation and debriefing, whenever I do a simulation, I always learn a, you know, something that I can do better. For sure, and that's our that's our goal to, to help our learners to learn to get better. But if we find that the same sort of error is being um, you know done with scenario after scenario, then it's not really the learner's problem; it's the system's problem. And so th this uh, this team at St. Jude, I think that was actually their drawer, and they said, "Hey, like you know, in the debriefing." Our, our learners can't find the equipment they need. Maybe we should organize the drawer. That's, that's maybe an obvious example. But when we do debriefings, part of it, yes, is what can you do better? What could the team have done better? But another question is what could the system do better to help you do better? So at a certain point, um, you know, we have so many things going on in our head. 
and things get more complex, we need the system to change. And so, you know, if after scenario after scenario, people are forgetting the steps of Mr. Sopa as the facilitator, as the NRP instructor, you can say maybe we should put a Mr. Sopa uh, sign on the wall behind the radio corner. Uh, if a particular, if the code card is hard to find, yes, that's a that's a, a good thing to practice to, to say, hey, like you need to look for the code card quicker. But part of it, you need to just move the code card right next to the to the room so that people don't make this mistake. And so this is a this is a run chart by one of our other hospitals who focused on latency safety threats, uh, Children's Orange County. And they were able to demonstrate and they counted what they considered latent safety threats over the course of this uh, year. And you know, so each of these dots is a, a different um, simulation scenario. And there's different people. This is not a team getting better. This is these are all different people working on each of these scenarios. This is the system getting better. And so what can we do? We can use simulation and debriefing, first of all, as a tool for quality improvement. It is sort of like a PDSA cycle, which I imagine you're familiar with that in quality improvement, that you can test each time as you do a simulation. Yes, part of it is you are looking for ways to, to help our teams to get better and find the debriefing points that they could learn, how to get better as a team, as individuals. But part of it is also learning how to get better as a system. And so I really appreciate that Gary has included a quality improvement chapter in, in the eighth edition. It is a you know it's a, a brief primer that is meant as almost as an introduction, I think, and it gives some ideas of what one can do in QI. And there are other QI articles about uh, neonatal resuscitation, and these are just some examples of topics that one could take on as a, a quality improvement project for the delivery room. Um, the environment, changing roles, temperature, uh, respiratory management, communication, and then cord management, which I'll talk a little bit more about soon. So, this is one of the top 10 points as well. Most newly born infants do not require immediate cord funding uh, resusc or resuscitation and can be evaluated and monitored during skin to skin with their mothers after birth. And, and so, part of the, our, our change in, in the uh, NRP um, in addition is that the questions have evolved so that one of the questions is the milk for management plant. We heard a little bit about that today and yesterday. And uh, so another slight change is sort of reflects what actually happens in practice in terms of the, the steps of uh, the initial steps, warm, dry, same way, position, airway, and such. So, um, yeah, we've, we've heard these recommendations already about cord management. We're going to um, generally delay cord clamping for 30 seconds or more. And then for cord milking, um, less than 28 weeks, not recommended. But I think you also heard today that there are knowledge gaps in this area of cord management. We're still learning. And this is, this is an active area of research. I think in the next few years, uh, we will learn more about how, you know, what we should be doing with cord management. Um, this, is, this is a study about the, the uh, cord milking and why we, we are no longer, or we don't recommend cord milking. We looked in California across a, a group of hospitals said, hey, let's look at cord, umbilical cord management. Um, you know, uh, some a little bit after um, the 2015 guidelines, we said, hey, we should start looking at this. And um, this shows the variation across the, the four years of NICUs that participated in this project to collect data on mobile cord management. There was huge variation, and this, this is um, uh, observed to expected ratios, but in terms of uh, absolute numbers, I think there were about two or three NICUs that had a local delayed on mobile cord clamping for uh, uh, about 90% of their patients. And then there were quite a few that had less than 20%. And then there was a, a wide spectrum in between. So there's large variation in practice, which ultimately means that probably there's an opportunity for quality improvement. And so we embarked on a series of sort of learning uh, together, a uh, collaborative as well on this topic. Um, and this, this uh, is now we've compiled a series of resources. 
I think the first thing we learned is that nobody is actually clocking this data systematically. So we learned from some of our centers, how can we actually track this better? And so some of our centers shared how they interacted with their uh, electronic health record colleagues to put in a, um, you know, a, a template for reporting the report delay or milking or for the baby three uh, before the report was planned. And, um, and then there was a series of webinars that we did uh, where teams set came up with uh, uh, how they implemented the report management, working with their obstetric colleagues and uh, how they basically were able to implement not just data collection, but actually in practice. And so learning together, I think we have seen a steady increase over the, over the past few years in this practice. As we are waiting for some of the research to be done. We, we know there are trials going on right now, and maybe we will have some results in a few years and don't know what that will be. But I kind of suspect that we will be doing something a little bit more than what we're doing now. I don't know exactly what or for who, but I think something is going to change in, in what we do with the mobile court. And, and we're probably going to continue to delay court clamping. On top of that, Will there be some situations where we start to do a little bit more than the stimulating the baby? And so um, and for, I think there already have been devices that have been sort of uh, constructed companies that make carts specifically for the purpose of resuscitating a baby while the cord is intact. Um, but they are expensive, not necessarily rigorously studied. And so I think if there is a recommendation to sort of, for example, provide CPAP or provide PPD while the cord is intact, there will be some work needed to implement how do we actually do that across you know, all the hospitals in the US. And so I think you know, in preparation for that, there are various groups that are working on platforms, carts, or uh, devices to facilitate that. And um, I think ultimately, probably simpler will be better to in. And in that context, we have done some work in simulation to try to see what is going to work well um, for this potential uh, application of therapy. And so uh, this figure is picture in the upper left is a simulation of a, a baby being delivered, a preterm baby in cortisone half and starting to do some resuscitation. And, and simulation helps us then to figure out what are some of the issues involved that you know, maybe we won't have a cart or, or a device then what will we need to think about? How will we need to implement this? Because uh, if you look at that figure, you, know, you can probably tell because you've been in C-sections uh, often enough, who's who, but you can see they're all working pretty closely together, right? And if you're looking at the hands, you know, who is the obstetrician, who is the uh, neonatal provider, how will we uh, implement this? And, and then even the, the layout of who stands where in a C-section, if we need to do this sort of practice, I think are things that we can learn through simulation, ultimately can test and hopefully uh, implement um, so that it can be done consistently and taught well. And then um, we're going to talk about this, this third point, and uh, it's, a, it's a preface to equipment uh, again. And inflation and ventilation of lungs are the priority in newly born infants who need support after birth. I'm going to talk about meconium because like we haven't talked about it at all today. And so we always have to talk about meconium in the gestation <laughs> conference, right? And so, you know, we, we have uh, some evidence and why we've shifted over the years is that we, we, we know, and there's more and more evidence that like if we delay ventilation for a baby who needs it, that's going to increase their risk of adverse outcomes. And this, this study was one of the earlier ones in Tanzania that, that taught us that. Um, and then thinking about what changed practice, you know, for, for me over the years in terms of meconium and intubation is that you know, this, this uh, landmark trial by uh, Tom Westwell and colleagues, this large RCT, almost 2,100 babies to help us to learn that we don't need to intubate babies who are vigorous, you know, even if they have meconium. Now, the question remained then after this trial, what about the non vigorous babies who we intubated for, for some time after the, that trial? And over the past you know, five, 10 years, there have been researchers who have studied that question, and there was enough evidence to do a systematic review a few years ago. 
and um, we ask should endotracheal suction versus no uh, suction be applied to this population. And, and then there's a fifth uh, uh, RCT now, now that there's, there's five RCTs that study this question. They're all in India. Um, and then there was one other study in the systematic review from Shirohulu uh, and colleagues in um, Texas that was an observational study that took advantage of the, the, some of the change in guidelines that occurred in 2015. And so just let me go over this pretty quickly, but there was ultimately no difference in intubation and suction versus not in this population um, for the primary outcome of survival of this charge. And this uh, page is meant to show you that all the other, the secondary outcomes that are listed there, the meta-analyses, which ultimately show that there was no difference between intubation and suction versus not for the development of paramedic, HIE, coning aspiration, and so forth. There was, uh, for the outcome of need for mechanical ventilation, an observational study, which took advantage of like this pre, it was a pre-post design of what happened after the guidelines recommended not intubating, that there was potentially a benefit to intubation inception. So the question remains. And, and, and so there were some other studies then that were done kind of similar that looked at what happened before and after um, the guidelines changed to, to not suction. And so this is one study um, uh, Using the uh, Oxford network uh, patients, 300,000 infants, and basically looked at before uh, the seventh edition to, to after, and they found that the NICU admissions for meconium aspiration syndrome actually decreased. And ultimately, the outcomes were generally seeming better actually after the change. So, somewhat, it's not an RCT, but somewhat reassuring that the, the practice change did not seem to make things worse. Um, similar study, 14,000 uh, plus infants in, in a large uh, academic hospital. First of all, intubation rates fell. And then the other outcomes ultimately seem to also potentially get, even if anything, a little bit better. But it's important, I think, to, to note that even as this population of babies who had meconium state and amniotic fluid didn't seem to get worse, that uh, this last point, there might be long term, they pointed out these out, there's long term consequences on intubation experience for frontline providers. When I was a resident, it would not be uncommon. Like I would practice intubating three babies on one call night because there was a couple of deliveries and so forth. And, and now our residents may get three chances to intubate during their three years of residency. So, how does that affect our practice or, and potentially the neonatal outcomes of you know, any kind of population? Uh, this is just another study, observational study. Again, they found that there was no difference after the guideline change in incidence of clinical aspiration um, or some of these other outcomes, and ultimately they had less than three patients. And then in Calif we looked in California and found something similar where the incidence of meconium aspiration syndrome decreased after the guidelines to, to not intubate um, and make the admissions for that purpose. So that's a long preface actually to get to, to sort of two points that I have is that we still have a gap, I think. I, if you notice the, the systematic review, um, there's, it's kind of, you know, reasonable that helped us to think, well, we don't need to intubate babies, but it wasn't like 100% definitive. It's, there'd be more, there needed to be, there needs to, if we really want to answer this question, and there's a randomized control, but it has to have a larger number of patients and probably more validity in terms of was the baby actually intubated and, and such. Um, but there's a lot of challenges to doing a large RCT like that. And perhaps maybe have we evolved where maybe the best we'll have are these large, well-designed observational studies. Um, because now that we have several of these observational studies, does that help me to think that the change was the right move? I think it does to some degree. If we can actually get a large RCT, yes, that would be great. Um, but if that doesn't happen, I'm, I'm sort of starting to think, yes, that what we've come up with is probably the best step that we can do. And then the, the, the other question is maybe there's a certain group of babies that are non vigorous, but that would still benefit from suction. And, and maybe is there some way to study that? And 
And with that, there's this context. So there, we, our, our residents, our fellows, us, we're just not intubating babies as often, not just in the delivery room, for sure in the delivery room, but even in the NICU. First of all, we've done quality improvement to try to reduce un, unintended excavations, which happens more frequently. And now we're really careful to try to avoid that. And our preterm infants, we are doing our best to try to reduce invasive ventilation. I think this has really um, big implications, you know, even as our, especially our really preterm infants now, our residents and fellows are not even allowed to intubate those babies, especially if they haven't done enough, because they're, now we know that there's a potential risk of IVH, so that was the most experienced person to intubate. And, you know, there's a, a good uh, uh, source of literature to show that, you know, intubation is not easy. It's a skill that um, you know progresses over time. The more you do, you're going to get better. But even uh, attending neonatologist is only successful on the most effect in 64% of the time. Um, and there are potential adverse consequences of not being able to today the first or even the second time. The, this study found that uh, the median number of conditions needed to achieve um, confidence was 18 fellows, but some fellows did not even, you know, achieve that even after 50 encounters. Um, and ultimately, some fellows were not able to demonstrate confidence uh, throughout the course of their fellowship. It's, and it's not really, you know, this is not their fault, right? This is a, a problem with the system. There are um, video learnoscopes out there now, products that help us to train and, and perform intubations better. And this was a QI project to, to demonstrate that. But even with the video learnoscope, you can see that it's, it's not 100%. Uh, I appreciate this review by Taylor Sawyer uh, last year, in which he reviewed the history of intubation. And um, what you might be able to see there is that the figure A is a learnoscope from 1928. And B is from now. Well, I mean, you can kind of see that they look pretty similar, right? You might have a different one, but in terms of the general shape and what it does, it's quite similar. And then, and then C is a, one of the video scopes. And then if you think, we think back to technology in 1928 to what we have now, many things have changed. But if you think about the rotoscope, first of all, it's modeled after an adult rotoscope, right? It's a little bit smaller. Um, and it hasn't changed. And, and that's, maybe that's not completely fair because there's many things from 1928 that look the same now. But that's probably because they're still working fine and there's no need to change it. And probably even 10 years ago, there was no need to change the logic scope because we got enough practice that it, it worked fine. But I don't think it's working fine now for our trainees and for the future, even for us. Like, how many times have I intubated this past year? Very few. And, and so I don't know what the, the solution is, except for that I think we need to come up with something. It may be that video laryngoscopes are part of the answer. I'm not sure why they haven't increased in uptake. It does seem like they are helpful both for training and, and for practice, um, but maybe there, there needs to be something that done to it. Maybe cost, maybe ease of use to, to make it more widespread. But ultimately, it, you, know, uh, you know, Gary, pointed out the laryngeal mask, the importance of that as a potential um, you know, alternative airway. And I, I know there are, there's uh, already research going on, uh, has been published and, and further uh, going on to help us to figure out, is this something that should be used earlier, sooner, in more circumstances? And I think we'll, we'll um, learn more about that and, and for maybe uh, tech devices that are, are designed for, for preterm babies, smaller preterm babies. And then ultimately, maybe there's the laryngoscope and the, the tube or some way, like maybe that's, the, it should change. We need engineers, innovators, designers to help us to figure this out. Because I think more and more, this is gonna be, not just for meconium, but in today and babies in general, I don't think we're preparing our, our trainees appropriately for, for so the system needs to change. So as we look to the future, um, 
even I think we can learn and innovate in terms of how we train and maintain our skills, how we learn together as teams, and we've learned a lot of that already through simulation and debriefing. Um, I think we can also think about how we can change the systems of care and use quality improvement and other strategies to ultimately advance our clinical outcomes. The, you know, we're more and more working with our obstetric obst colleagues and local part management um, is one area I think we, we have to work closely together. Uh, I worked at a hospital where we routinely did simulations together with the obstetric team. And one example is like postpartum hemorrhage combined with the baby having uh, fetal blood loss. And so we simulated together, we debriefed together, and I felt like there was a great benefit in that um, practice. Just sort of learning what the other team is dealing with and debriefing together also helped us to see how can we help each other in this environment. And local flood management is a, a, a great example of uh, where we can sort of work together. And then ultimately, I think we need to work with colleagues in um, industry, engineering to figure out how can we improve the devices that we use for monitoring intervention, including um, ventilation and CPR. So, yeah, it's customary to, to end with a thank you, but I am truly grateful to um, all of you here. I think as, as I talked about collaborative learning, uh, I, I feel like the symposium is a fantastic way to, to get together. People are interested in this uh, area to learn together. And um, thank you to Marilyn, who's a, a great um, mentor, a friend, a guard of the committee, and um, yeah, I really appreciate um, just the ability to, to be here today with you. Thank you. We have time for only one question or comments. From the audience, this is it was fantastic having taken such a summary. I think that you summarized very nice on the technical day. It was a, it was a fantastic day for all of us. And I want to thank those who survived and do you not know, give resuscitation at the end of the day. <laughs> um, we, uh, we really appreciate very much uh, your effort of coming here. Uh, I want to thank especially Nathan and, and Chelsea for their hard work. And, you know, <laughs> It was really great to have you all here and, uh, and thank you for your patience on this first time hybrid symposium. I want to thank our sponsors without their help. It wasn't the news so you see in the slide. We have KSC product as so the Mike Johnson, Fashion Michael, and the American Academy of Pediatrics. And we look forward to seeing you next year. Thank you so much. <laughs>